And from this, we transition to a security forum with former Director of National Intelligence James Clapper and former CIA Director Michael Hayden. They're joining other national security officials to talk about some of the threats to democratic institutions. It's hosted by George Mason University in Virginia. We join it live in progress. Uh, but you two, if you two were both right now sitting uh, on top of the U.S. intelligence community, would you be meddling in Russian affairs as a, as a, uh, as a best defense is a good offense kind of maneuver? Would you be advocating for doing the things to Russia that they're trying to do to us? So I, I think I would be in the mode of imposing costs, all right? Doing what it is they do to us, I, I, don't, I don't think would, would in any way be reciprocity. I mean, it, it's just a totally different system. And, and, and so their leverage- They have weaknesses in their society. But, but they have, yes, but they have different leverage points. All right, so uh, leverage points uh, might, might be, be, the, be the fact that you, you've, you've got the Siloviki, the, the strong people around Putin who are living very, very well, and most of the country is not. And, and reviewing how and why and to what degree they live well and others don't, I think would be a, a, a very useful tool. There was a, a fascinating dialogue, Jeff, oh, March. You had the outgoing commander of Cyber Command and the incoming commander, so Mike Rogers and Paul Nakasone, at separate, separate points in front of uh, the uh, Armed Services Committee and then the Intelligence Committee, being asked by senators, well, you've, you've said the president hasn't given you specific directions, but if he asked you, what can I do, what would you do? And, and, and both of their answers were, separately, outgoing, incoming, was they haven't paid high enough cost. We need to impose costs on the, on the Russians, which is not at all defending against the Russians. I mean, they, they obviously would be in favor of defending, but that's not what they were proposing here. They, they were proposing costs. More action. More action. And as Cybercom commander, they, they were in essence asking for political and legal guidance above the, 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 the normal threshold of cyber espionage, but below the threshold of what anyone would define as armed conflict. In, in other words, a, a very aggressive, cost-imposing strategy against the Russians, not preventing them from doing what they do, but making them come to their own conclusion that it was probably a bad idea. Right. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the other aspect of this you have to consider, which uh, we ran into in the Obama administration, particularly with respect to uh, reacting to the Russian meddling, uh, contemporaneously was you always have to weigh what will be the counter retaliation um, and that's what tempers I think uh, from a political stand or policy standpoint the use of uh, cyber offensive weapons because unless you are pretty confident in your ability to, to withstand a counter retaliation and that you're and you're resilient enough to recover from it you want to think twice before you take you know, any kind of actions like that. So to answer your question, Jeff, if it were me sitting there, I would say, I, I, I certainly think that it would be appropriate to tee up a menu of things, options that the policymakers can, dis to include policymaker number one, could decide on, but also be sure to point out what the downsides are of employing any of those tools. You may recall that the reason what occasioned the, uh, or heightened the uh, strong personal animus that Vladimir Putin had for Hillary Clinton was because of her alleged role in promoting what he thought was another color revolution during their election in, 20, uh, in 2011. So this is clearly a vulnerability of theirs. Right. The, deci the, the decision is, do you want to, to exploit that, which we certainly could. Right. But you need to think about, okay, what are they gonna do as a counter that. And that always, you know, the Obama administration took a lot of crit criticism for not doing more right. uh, at the time. Uh, and that was part of the calculus that we got into because it's not as though we didn't seriously consider all this at the time. I need to add, though, something Jim suggested earlier, and I just want to highlight, all right? Uh, what we just talked about here is, is, is pretty much the equivalent of a painkiller, all right? 
the fundamental issue here is not Russia. The fundamental issue here is the United States. And, and we, we would have a degree of this problem, and I, I think a, 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 a serious degree of this problem, even without Russian so our own societal weaknesses or the I, system? I, I, you know, I can't prove Jim's premise that the Russians flipped the election. So I, I just simply say that's not just unknown, it's unknowable. So it's not very interesting. We're not going to talk about it. Donald Trump is the legitimate president of the United States. And so now the question is, how is President Trump governing? Right. Right? And, and that's, that's the core issue here. One more question on that. As intelligence chiefs, if you were in office right now, would you be comfortable sharing very, very sensitive intelligence information about Russia with the President of the United States? Binary choice. Carry Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, and Wisconsin, you get the secrets. Oh, yeah, I don't think there's no choice there. There's no choice. You're, at, you're, you're obliged to be as forthright and fulsome with whatever, whatever uh, sense of intelligence you have. Right. Absolutely. Let me lift up and ask you this question about our strength as a democracy right now. Because, again, we're talking about a symptom, not necessarily a cause. Uh, years ago, Frank Fukuyama wrote, uh, obviously, a very important article, The End of History, which he posited, essentially, that uh, the world had come to the conclusion that market democracy, liberal democracy, was an endpoint, a political endpoint. <laughs> Everybody had agreed that this was the way we were going to organize our societies in the future. Three, four years ago, President Obama spoke regularly about um, a, a moral arc of the universe that was long but bent toward justice. There was a kind of feeling um, through the previous presidencies, previous several presidencies, that time and human behavior were on America's side, on the side of democracy, democratic development, um, and that we were aiming for, toward something, toward the widespread adoption of an American model. Um, I'm surprised. A lot of other people are surprised um, at just how fragile this idea is. And I'm wondering if that, for you two, is, is among the bigger surprises of the last couple of years, or how you, how you think about the durability of American democracy and the democratic experiment. That's like an essay question, but answer it in a minute. <laughs> I mean, that, that's a very heavy question. I, I, I do recall uh, President Obama speaking about this, uh, both privately and publicly, about you know, the great institutions, the values, norms of this country, which have, have been durable, but they're all, at the same time, they're all so fragile. And if the practitioners and supporters of those institutions, norms, standards, and behavior um, choose for whatever reason not, not to uh, support them, then we're in real trouble. And, and so I think the, these institutions are uh, a lot more fragile than, than, than people think. I think there's a, we take them for granted because we've been, you know, it's the way we've been for so long. I do think uh, it's one of the reasons why, um, um, I'll let Mike speak for himself, but I think it's one of the reasons Mike and I have chosen to, to, to speak out uh, to, to make that point, you know, to try to do our little part to try to educate the public about the fragility of our institutions. Right. Noting, note, I'll come to you in a second, but noting something interesting about, this seems now a, a, a normal conversation with these two gentlemen, um, but imagine 10 or 15 years ago, these two gentlemen being considered political dissonance in our country, sitting at, I mean, you're not exactly from, let's say, Haight-Ashbury. I mean, you know, I, I, I mean, uh, and, and some, something remarkable has happened where, where people, you ran the NSA, for goodness sake, yeah, you know, uh, where, Jeff, where... Let me speak to that real quick. Let me jump in here because because uh, I want to talk about Mike. Um, you know, I, Robert, I, I think it's the mic. It's the not, mic has slipped, jump. I think. Maybe move it up. I, I retired from the military. You hear that? <laughs> Attention on deck, you know. Uh, I retired from the military 23 years ago. Um, I never gave a thought to uh, speaking out or you know, going on television or any of that. But, you know, my dad was a signal intelligence officer for 28 years, so it was almost genetically antithetical for me, you know, to speak out. Well, we're in different, uh, a different mode here. And I will always be indebted to Mike Caden because, you know, low point of my time during DNI, both personally and institutionally, was uh, Snowden and his aftermath. And Mike did a great public service to this nation and to the intelligence community because he could go on the tube 
and explain things to people that I'd spend days trying to get cleared through all the lawyers before I could say anything about it. <laughs> and I remembered th that model, a prototype example that Mike set, and he, con that he, and he continues to, to set. And I said, you know, it's my turn, I'm gonna do the same thing. That's ver they're very kind. So I, I, back to your original question, how fragile is this? I begin my book by reminiscing about walking through wartime Sarajevo. It's about 1994, uh, beautiful city, formerly, and, and you, could see, you could see along the skyline and, and mixed in with the Austrian government buildings, you had, you had steeples and minarets and onion-shaped domes. So this has been a, a vibrant, uh, tolerant city. And you could see in the hills above it, Serbian artillery. And you could see in the streets below the results of the, the Serbian artillery. And what struck me at the moment as I was walking through and talking to Sarajevans was not that they were different from us, but how much they were not different from us. And so the thought that I had, and I've kept in my heart, that the, you know, that city was the host of the Winter Olympics 10 years before that, okay? The veneer of civilization is, is, is actually very thin. And although it may be our natural right, according to our theory of, of natural law, it is, a not, it is not a naturally occurring phenomenon and therefore needs energy and nurturing and care. And we should not take it for granted. So how fragile really is it? Because we've been doing this for 240 <clears throat> years. Granted, the 1860s were not an apex for, for, for the system, but we came out of the 1860s as one country. I mean, it, on the other hand, it seems remarkably durable, and it seems a little bit fantastical to think that a television real, a reality TV star can undo what, what took Americans 240 years to build. So, I mean, I mean, we talk about this thin layer, this veneer of democracy and civilization, but... So, I mean, so to, to, to respond, I don't think he can undo it in four. Can you undo it in eight is the yeah. obvious follow-up? Okay. Yeah, I do. You do? I do? Yeah. I mean, the sounds you hear from across the river are institutions digging in. All right, and following what our perception is, the rule, the rule of law. And how long can they withstand? Because, I mean, we have made the presidency a very powerful office. Re read the Federalist Papers, all right? There, there are reasons we want him to act with dispatch, all right? And so, so to, let, me, but let me give you an, another historical moment here, and I'll, I'll be really efficient about this. Uh, I, I don't think it's 1860. I think it's the 1890s. All right, now, very, very quickly, in the 1890s, there was a lot of turmoil in, in the country, fundamentally because we were trying to adjust the institutions that had governed us as an agricultural society and to convert those institutions into ones that would serve an industrial society. Okay. Um, and we actually had a populist run for president, twice, William Jennings Bryan. And he wanted to monetize silver, inflate the economy, ruin the financial class at, for the benefit of the debtor class, which would have prevented industrialization. Now, the kicker is he lost twice. We were going through, and we got Teddy Roosevelt and McKinley. And, 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 we, we, and we got a get on with it, adjusting the institutions, still anchored in the first principles, but adjusting them, Sherman Antitrust Act and so on, in order to govern an industrial society. We are now trying to do the same thing, adjust the institutions of an industrial society to govern a post-industrial information age, interconnected, uh, fill-in-the-blank oh, society, yeah. all right? And our populist ran for president again, and he won. And, and, and his response to this is, we don't want to become that new society. We don't want to be globalist, right? We want to be, I mean, we don't want to be protectionist. We don't want to be internet. I mean, all the things that that new society is, he is pushing back against. So my fear is, is not, not just the kind of the general brittleness of these institutions. My fear, Jeff, is we're not getting on with it. And, and we're not making the adjustments. And, and so if- Of course, China is, by the way. Yeah, and, and, and so it, it's just not a, a static, well, they, they've worked for 250 years, why won't they work for the next 25? It, it is, no, we've got to make changes, and if we refuse to make changes, they will fail. Right, 
We're going to go to questions in, in one minute, but before we do, I want to pivot from what you said to, to the future. Um, and you talked about the institutions across uh, the river. Uh, well, actually, it's on this side of the river that I was thinking of. To tell you the truth. <laughs> no, I want to ask a very specific question. The zip code is still a DC zip code. Yeah, DC zip codes. <laughs> um, well, how about let's just talk about both sides of the river for a minute. Um, and, and I want to ask you, um, a, 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 a narrow question that leads to a big question. The narrow question is, how do you buttress the, the laws and institutions so that they can withstand the changed norms of, of this president? Which is to say, let's talk about the Pentagon and the CIA, just as two institutions. Just throw in the Justice Department, whatever you want. The FBI. Uh, the FBI, obviously. Um, uh, how do you buttress those for the next two or six years so that they maintain their coherence and cohesion and their commitment to constitutional democracy. Um, and then the larger question is, what, when, when you think about the future, how do you defend the, 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 the parts of America that you believe are worth defending, the parts of this system that are worth defending? So, I mean, take it narrow and go big or just go right to big. Both of you can take that question. Well, I think... Uh... I mean, it's man, pretty ponderous questions here. But I, I think uh, I'm a ponderous guy. <laughs> something I'm, I've, I've observed <clears throat> is uh, whether it's conscious or not, but a lot more uh, local activism. And you 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 travel around the country and you see what you know governors are doing and and mayors of cities. And, you know they're gonna they're trying to get on with what's right uh, for their communities, their states, whatever. Uh, I do think the, the, the activist groups uh, need to try to keep, uh, and the media need to keep uh, the administration honest uh, and call them out when, uh, continue to call them out as uh, monotonous as that becomes, when there are distortions or lies. Um, so I think there's a lot of, and I, at the individual level, uh, I, I get asked, and I'm sure Mike does too, well, what can I do? You know, well, one thing you do is next Tuesday <laughs> is vote. Uh, that, that is a, an ever, you know, a cherished feature of our system. And we, all of us as individuals, need it to protect it by exercising it. The, um, the challenge is how do, how do institutions push back against the most norm-busting president in our history without violating their own norms. And so, for example, in front of you now are two career intelligence officers on the edge of violating their own norms by being here, okay? And the fact that we're both under contract to CNN, all right, as you suggested earlier, my goodness, that's really different. And we're, you know, we're not alone. You got Morell, McLaughlin, Bash, Phil Mudd, John Brennan. John Brennan, all, all out there because we deeply feel about what is going on in the country. That the line we use when we we, we don't coordinate, but when we, we talk to one it's another, and share, you know, know. right, right, right. yeah. <laughs> Maybe there should be but, more. <laughs> but, 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 the, but the unifying thought I think that we share is that this isn't normal. We shouldn't pretend that it is normal. We should keep emphasizing it's it's not normal. But again, how do we do that without violating our own norms? So I'm, you know, Jim's career military, I'm career military. Donald Trump is the commander in chief, period, dot. There's no question about that. And so I'll, I'll give you a, a real world example now, all right? How does the NORTHCOM commander talk about the security theater, theater that is his operational order to send 5,000 troops to the southern border? Right? How, how, I mean, look. North Com is commander of North America. Right. So, so, I mean, look at the, look at the moral and professional dilemma that that officer is in, obeying what is undoubtedly a legal order, but clearly done for political rather than strategic or, or tactical effect. So, what is it he allows himself to say? And, and, and something you won't see, what is it he allows himself to tell his people? What does he tell his troops? Very good question. 
Why don't we um, you yeah, come over here and then we'll go back there? Do you have there's one mic or two mics? One mic. First, uh, from the bottom of my heart, and I'm sure everyone's heart. Thank you thank for you. all you do. Uh, So what you're talking about is so fundamental to the survival of our democracy and the world. Uh, oh, well. Can you hear me back there? There you go. Uh, so it's so fundamental. Thank you for the, what you're doing as former senior government and intelligence officials. And there are some other former officials. But there are very few current officials or Republicans in Congress that are willing to say the line has been crossed. And accepting your point that you, in order to do that, you have to violate your norms, at some point, that line gets so dangerous, and the example you just used of a valid military order, he is the commander in chief, he can give orders, but when Will we start to see what, what will it take for members of the military, members of the administration, or Republican members of Congress to start to stand up and say, it's gone too far? So let, let, me start, ahead, yeah. let, let me start with the institutions, then I'll quickly jump to Congress. Um, again, the institutions have to try to observe their norms. All right? Maybe you realize that, that, that Fixing a norm-busting policy by busting your own norms adds to the damage being done to institutions and processes. So you've really got to be careful. Um, this is probably not going to help him uh, since we've got TV cameras rolling here, but I think Dan Coates has been really quite masterful over the last six to eight months. He, he doesn't pick a fight, doesn't beat his chest, but he answers, he answers questions about geostrategic issues in a very straightforward, honest way, and seems to be fairly indifferent whether or not he is on the same page of the hymnal or not of the folks downtown. Uh, the Joint Chiefs and the Secretary, uh, I think their response to the transgender ban tweet uh, by, by, by the President was about as close to the edge as you can get. And there the issue was... Could you describe that for once? Sure. The, the President tweeted from uh, the, the residents one morning when he was scheduled to get a long briefing on his options with regard to transgender troops, all right? And he tweeted, it's over, they're done, We're, they're, they're not gonna be in, in the military. And the problem for the chiefs was that they may or may not have had a, a different view three, four, five years ago about transgender troops, but now they were their troops. And, and, and they had a moral commitment to these people because they were on the team and they, their ethic would not allow them to abandon them. So the issue is still <clears throat> under study, <laughs> all right, in the Department of Defense. So you do have institutions in the executive branch. What is odd is that the constitutional limit on the president should be the Article I guys, it should be the Congress. Not only is Congress not limiting the president to date, right? The president is enlisting his party in Congress to beat up the agencies of the executive branch that he cannot seem to bring to heel simply by executive fiat. I have never seen anything like that in my life. Yeah, speaking of the fragility of uh, our institutions, I, I think, and I completely agree with Mike about uh, Dan Coates and, and another, another one I'd cite is Chris Ray's director of FBI. Yeah. They haven't been out there picking fights, but when the occasion called for, they very quietly and I think effectively made the points that needed to be made. I thought it was a very courageous thing Dan Coates did after Helsinki. When that statement, he came out. I'm sure he thought about, uh, you know, this could be it, but he stood on a principle. And uh, that's why I think there is a really uh, double burden, heavy burden on the leaders of these institutions particularly, uh, to thread that fine line, as Mike characterizes it, between standing up for what's right and not violating the norms. I think there was a, yeah, back there. And then we'll come down around here. I want to second the motion that uh, thank you very much for being here. Um, you guys are the best of America. And my question is, well, 
What do you do about South uh, about Saudi Arabia in light of current events? Uh, well, oh, yeah, to see, our time's nearly up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this obviously isn't company policy, and Mike might, might maybe disagree with this, but I think we should have been uh, a much more uh, stalwart response to that. I, I'm, and I mean by that, cutting off diplomatic relations, PNG and the ambassador really conveying a message here that that, that behavior is completely unacceptable. And arms, arms deals be damned. Explaining what PNG is and what it would well, persona non grata, which is a diplomat a, a, a term that's used in, among in the diplomatic world for uh, telling somebody to leave. He actually right. did it to him. The ambassador actually did it to himself. Well, he, I mean, he, he left, but we, we he, he, he's technically welcome to return. Right. right. So, we, but we didn't we didn't do that. Right. And then well, this, uh, you know, trying to rationalize uh, behavior. I mean, uh, uh, the president does have what I would call very elastic evidentiary standards that uh, he, he conven conveniently applies, and that, that's certainly uh, the case here. I, I wrote a piece for thehill.com. It uh, popped up on the site 10 o'clock yesterday, about 1,300 words on this, and I, I try to walk through it. First point I make is this is a really tough call for the president. This is, this is not an easy question for any president, period. Uh, but, you know, we talked... We talked earlier about you know, with the, the words matter and, and he set the context and, okay, he's not responsible for the synagogue killing, but, you know, actions matter. And that's why we, we've been complaining for two years. Um, what we have done in our relationship with the kingdom is personalize it between the young minister of just about everything in, in the White House and the crown prince, a 37-year-old and a 33-year-old. We not only don't have an ambassador in Riyadh, we haven't even nominated an ambassador to Riyadh. And, and, and so rather than having the structures of government, which I think, Jim, gives us a better chance of being, I think, tougher, as you suggest, uh, after the murder, we, we have this thing based on a personal relationship, which is just structurally and procedurally wrong. And, and if you keep doing stuff wrong over time, bad things, are, there are going to be consequences for that. Um, what I point out in the article is they did it, they intended it, and he had to know. All right? Absolutely. And, and, and now the intel guys have got to stand in the room there, giving the president that information and refusing to budge. And frankly, you know, in that private moment, grabbing the vice president or maybe the national security advisor and saying, you realize if the other branch asks us, we're going to tell them the same thing, too. That's, that's hard. And again, back to institutions. I, I had to go and tell George Bush some really unpleasant things, but I never felt it was going to threaten my, my, my work for the president. There were some questions. Um We'll come right over here, yeah. Hello, um, Nicholas Dumovich, uh, former CIA. Good to see you. Um, now teaching at the Catholic University of America, and I teach undergraduates about intelligence and national security. A lot of them are interested in those careers. What do I tell them? What advice do you have well, for these people in college who are interested in serving their country and in intelligence? And given the conditions. That's a great thing. I, uh, and I, I know Mike has uh, done the same thing I've done. As, you know, we've trooped around a lot of uh, colleges and universities. And I've I personally found it very uh, encouraging, very motivating that there are a lot of great young people out there that are very interested in public service, specifically in the national security arena and in intelligence. And what I... Uh, Try to tell them is what, you know, what, what attracted me, why I was motivated to stay in it as long as I did, that it is a noble profession. Uh, it's a sacred public trust. Uh, there's the satisfactions you get by being part of something larger than yourself and contributing to the safety and security of the country. And I have been uh, uniformly, uh, no, no college or university that I've been to, uh, I've been to big ones and small ones. A cadre of young people, great young people that still want to serve and are still interested in it. 
uh, despite the current atmospherics. I, um, what I generally say, Nick, for young folks is go do it, work hard, make this president better than he would otherwise be. And then I say, take good notes, keep them in the drawer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you, no, seriously, you gotta protect yourself. I have a different story the more senior you get. Yeah. And the more senior you get, the more I'm saying, eh, you may not wanna go do this, all right? Because if you are a very senior person in the administration, okay, you have to decide, what, number one, whether you have any effect, all right? And, and that's, you know, this is gonna be on you forever, so if you're not gonna have an effect, you ought to think twice. But beyond that, at, at the ethical level, Will you be the guardrail you think you're going to be? Or will your presence give the administration more legitimacy than it would otherwise have? Okay, so you're in Jim Mattis' job right now. Yeah. And the president says, send 5,000 troops down to the border to deal with this imaginary crisis. Do you say no? Do you say I quit? Do you do it? So no, no fair retired persons commenting on decisions folks and, and, you know, on the front lines have to make. But, but this, this is just the kind of question that I think that Secretary Mattis would, would have to think long and hard about. I mean, let me just have one other thought, too, all right? I go back to the intelligence part, all right? Um, look, if we, if we didn't have the current turmoil and y'all still wanted to have a session, he and I would be here, and y'all be complaining about all the stuff we used to do in government, all right? Whether it's surveillance, renditions, detentions, interrogations, targeted killings, all the yeah, whole, whole stuff, all right? Um, and, and we admit those are edgy things and things that we legitimately need to debate and argue about, and are we right? But they only take their legitimacy. They only take their legitimacy by being attached to a higher moral purpose. And if you doubt the government embraces that higher moral purpose, this loses its legitimacy and its validity. Uh, One more? I will say, yeah, I'll go yeah, absolutely. I will say, though, in the end, uh, you know, those are really per highly personal decisions. And what you, and I haven't gone through that myself a couple times, uh, what you weigh is, well, if I resign, uh, is that going to be more disruptive than if I stay? And I think that though you do weigh those kind of factors, and I, I'm sure uh, Jim Mattis, you know, he thinks about that as well. And anybody in those positions would. You got one more back there? Okay. Um, wherever you go, you're, you're the expert <laughs> over here. Thank you all be the last for coming. Uh, I'm Bill Eco. I have a question about our, this, this administration's diplomacy. Our president has kind of cozied up to autocrats and has disrupted our relationships with our traditional allies. Normally, presidents go visit Canada on their first trip abroad. He went to Saudi instead. Uh, and so, and, that, and you hear him talk about his love fest with Kim Jong-un. Uh, what is the long-term impact of the disruption in our traditional, our strong, strong, with, with our strongest allies? And what kind of damage is this doing, or is like, this likely to, to be doing, in terms of the willingness of our allies to cooperate with us, share intelligence with us, work with us on bigger global issues? You weekended in Pyongyang, so you, you should <laughs> take that. Well, and by the way, I want to say, uh, Director Clapper, I read your book this summer. It was fantastic. Thank you. And I look forward to reading yours, General Hayden. Thank you. Well, thanks. Uh, yeah, I appreciate the plug for the book. That's, uh, <laughs> um, well, uh, let me give you one example, Bill, uh, that uh, I, I can speak fairly authoritatively to. And I, I, I spent a lot of time in Australia. Uh, I'm some honorific title I have with the Australian National University. I spent a month there last year and again this year, I just got back. And there's great concern, uh, I know, among Australians and Canadians particularly, and the Brits, you know, our closest Five Eyes allies, about uh, 
you know, the path of America. You know, what, what are we going to pitch out of the traditional role we played, leading, you know, championing liberal democracy ever since World War II, where we kind of set the framework for the international order. And this is very disconcerting uh, to uh, our friends and allies uh, overseas. Um, what I told the Australians though this year is, look, you just can't keep wringing your hands over uh, your discomfiture with the, the behavior of this administration. And I said, you need to look for, for uh, if I could be so presumptuous as an American, tell them, you need to look for opportunities to fill those voids. You need to find uh, alliances that you can form. Uh, and if you perceive a leadership void, then other people got to fill it. And you know, uh, you see people, you see like uh, Japan, I think kind of uh, stepping up to that and figuring out ways using soft power that they can help fill the leadership void, notably for the TPP, which was, I thought, a terrible mistake to withdraw from that. Uh, at the same, and the other thing I, I tell Australians, and I think this is true of a lot of countries, that we have very deep and durable pillars of, a, of our relationship. Diplomacy, economic, or in the case of the Five Eyes Alliance, uh, our, our history, culture, and, and language, our military relationships, and certainly what Mike and I can attest to, some very deep intelligence relationships with lots of countries around the world. Those are pretty deep and durable, and I believe they will, at least to this point, have withstood uh, the uh, assaults, if you will, uh, caused by confusion about uh, our, our leadership role. And yeah, it is, it's a juxtaposition to, to embrace autocrats and at the same time diss our traditional uh, friends and allies. And it, it's uh, uh, very disconcerting to them. The um, work. Yeah, the, that's a great question and a good, good point to, to end on. The, the, the American strategy for the world we've now left for the last 75 years is actually written down. It's a document called NSC 68, uh, authored by Paul Nitze. It's available online, and I, in, in writing uh, the book, I actually downloaded it and reread it. One of the most used words in the document, it's a strategic document that Truman requested. One of the most used words in the document, and there are, there are pages of payons to this concept as being something necessary to ensure a world in which American values could survive, was the word diversity. It, it, it is throughout the document. Um, it had also called for a robust American role in order um, the American values, the American society, American democracy cannot survive in a world that is hostile to those values and therefore we must do what we can to create a world in which those values are, are more general or at least, at least survivable. And there are three things within the document less clear but I think have been the pillars of our approach is back to your question about, so how, how tough is this? How, how much longevity will it have? There are three things that have governed our, our course of action. Number one, immigration is a natural advantage to the United States. Alliance, alliances are a strategic asset, and free trade is good for America and good for the world. And all three of those now are, are not assumptions. All three of those are jump balls in, in, in American society. And I think that's one reason why you get so, I get it too, so much nervousness abroad. Jim talked about Australia. Um, I was in Stavanger, Norway in late August. I'm walking around a trade show, got recognized, a Norwegian came up, talked to me, made a couple mild complaints about where we are as a country, and then said, I grew up in a world in which a great and powerful nation wished my country well. My grandchildren do not live in that world. Thank you to you both. This is very fascinating to me. I appreciate it. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, everyone. Our next panel starts here at 1.15. So I look forward to seeing you back in your seats in the next 12 minutes. Thank you.